eight albums, 10 million records sold, and uh, she does this from her home in Stratford. Self-produced, self-managed, and runs her own record label, Lorena McKenna. Um, and unless she's miniaturized her harp, uh, which I haven't seen today, I'm eager to find out where she Lorena, come on. How you're going to give us a little music in our life. <laughs> Well, not having had the uh, opportunity to attend one of these events before, um, I wasn't quite sure what the format was, and um, my uh, colleague and I arrived yesterday uh, to, to participate in this event, uh, just from a spectating point of view, as well as for me to get a better idea of the spectrum of expression. Uh, we got sidetracked in a couple of other sort of emergency issues, and. Uh, uh, issues that we're involved in. And uh, so <laughs> when I arrived today and it was suggested to me perhaps I was going to sing, I think I was as surprised that people were expecting me to sing as <laughs> they were surprised to hear me to say that I was going to be speaking. Um, anyway, I mean, for both our interests, I felt that uh, it might be best for me to prepare a few notes uh, with a few extrapolations. First of all, I'm humbled and honored to be amongst the invitees of this year's Idea City. I've always considered my own little idea factory out in the wilds of Stratford to be a rather modest affair which has suited and reflected my own electrical impulses. When I reflect back on the impulses I would now categorize as ideas, be they good or bad, I marvel at one feature, how they can come to be from apparently nothing. Of course, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could, <laughs> unless, of course, you were a scientist specializing in zeros. Some people, I would go so far as to say, are addicted to ideas, the birthing of concepts which hadn't existed before, as I have often witnessed with puzzle lovers. In preparation for this 15 minutes of musing, I have attempted to go back and dissect my own ideas and my own ideas on ideas. Falling under that category as artist, I think one is inclined to say that every creative act is the pulling into being of an idea. Conversely, every idea, be it good or bad, is a creative exercise, which is why I often ask people who say they are not creative, have they ever had an idea? When they say yes, and I say, well, there you are, you've been creative. And if one understands that capacity in themselves and believes in it, nurtures it, cultivates it. They can be in for an interesting ride in life, as ideas can be vehicles for some great life experiences. So I thought I would examine the anatomy and lifeline of an idea from my own experience, insofar as there can be good ideas and bad ideas and new ideas and old ideas and maybe even recycled ideas, depending on the situation. They can be born out of different motivations. For me, most of my ideas emanate from a position of either need or curiosity. I've always tried to exempt my artistic creations from being born out of a sense of overt need, creating something in order to put money in my pocket. I've worried that if the artistic creative process comes from that motivation, it would be vulnerable to the contamination of a necessity and grow in some contrived way meaning in my case to try to come up with a hit single for a hit single's sake, which brings to mind how the success or caliber of an idea may be impacted by the parameters or specifications one heads out with. And yet I'm aware that for other artists, the need to put money in their pocket is an initial push to the creative process, which in itself leaves no stamp of being contrived or contaminated by the perception of what the market wants. For myself, I like to leave my need-motivated ideas to be spent on things such as trying to figure out how to get my keys out of the car now that I inadvertently lock them in it, or how to build my business infrastructure in a way that serves the values and philosophies which are peculiar to me. 
For me, the creative process has become a peculiar kind of dance of preparations emanating ultimately from an insatiable curiosity. I would say of my various afflictions, my curiosity is the greatest. It has been my savings grace for the most part when I have come up against something I can't figure out. My curiosity compels me on an almost involuntary basis to learn. It is usually in this space which curiosity carves out that ideas seem to occur, often followed by their near cousins, dreams, aspirations, and occasionally visions. When I look back on certain crossroads of my career in 1985, this was certainly one of them. I just finished up working at the Stratford Theatre in different capacities and had developed an interest in Celtic music. And is the case with a lot of folk music over the centuries, it would be impossible to fully appreciate it without understanding the political, economical, and social circumstances from which it sprang. My curiosity drove me to take a course in Irish history. And this interest in history, in all these senses, has continued to be a driving force behind and underneath most of my creative input. I thought I'd just stop there and expand on that point for a moment. Um, in 1991, I had the occasion to attend an exhibition uh, in Venice that was the most extensive exhibition ever held on the Celts. And it was at this point in time that I realized the Celts were much more than this mad collection of anarchists from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and so on. But they were this sort of vast collection of tribes that emanated from Middle and Eastern Europe as far back as 500 BC. And that over the course of years, they migrated across Europe and some would say with a great deal of encouragement from the Romans. Uh, so that, for example, Milan was a Celtic settlement. Uh, they were contemporaries of the Etruscans in Italy. Um, Coimbra in Portugal, Lyon in France, Leiden in the Netherlands were all Celtic settl settlements. So in 1991, I felt I had sort of exhausted uh, the traditional material, or the material that I could find that was traditional, that, was, that had strength, and I felt that I wanted to test out my own creative uh, impulses and see if I could use some of this uh, Celtic history as a springboard. And once I learned that the Celts came from these eastern uh, margins of, of Europe and Asia Minor, it gave me a, a tremendous uh, license and an opening of doors that I, when I reflect back on the way I create the recordings, in many respects, I tell people that I compare it to almost an exercise of travel writing. Um, I collect a lot of different kinds of books, uh, whether they're historical books or travel writing or fictional books of a particular period and place, and I will immerse myself in that. Um, in the Celts, for example, it was... Um, <laughs> It, in studying the Celtic history, I've also come to understand a bit of my own, I think, my own personality uh, being sort of a, an extrapolation of that broad Celtic mi migration. And I, know, I remember reading one report that identified a characteristic of the Celts saying, in some ways, there was more will than wit. They were very tenacious. They would kind of go out and, and do battle, but they weren't uh, well known for their strategic capacities and so on. Um, they also uh, were involved in many waterways in, in Europe. There were a, lo a lot of the waterways in uh, Europe are named after Celtic gods and goddesses. And they sort of function in some respects like trolls over those waterways, they extracting uh, money from people who needed to use them. And they also became uh, mercenaries for a lot of other uh, entities' uh, political endeavors. But in the Celts, so the early Celts, they were like a head cult. And uh, it, was fa it was fascinating to hear of uh, uh, one of the, I believe it might have been Rajiv Gandhi's funeral ceremony uh, some years ago where uh, they needed to ensure that the skull exploded because they felt that the skull, in the skull, the soul was, was har harbored. And this was also a very Celtic kind of notion. Um, just to give you a musical uh, link to this Eastern kind of uh, fascination I've had with the Celts and how 
this might even still be detected in, in places like Ireland, where the Romans never really settled, is a, very, is a, is a melody, uh, a song called She Moved Through the Fair, even though the lyrics were written at the turn of the century, the melody is actually quite old. And when you hear some of the Shano singings in the west coast of Ireland, they still embody a lot of what I hear and many others hear is very Eastern ornamentation. So I'll just sing a little bit of She Moves Through the Fair just to give you an idea of that. Um. <clears throat> my love said to me, my mother won't mind, and me father won't slight you for your lack of kind. Then she stepped away from me, and these she did say, it will not be long, love, till our wind meeting. Anyway, you can hear a little, a little turns in that. Um, Getting back to the, the creative process, <laughs> I have long marveled at the process of coming up with a creative idea. Back in 1991, I made my own little tribute to this process in the title of my fourth recording, The Visit, because in many respects there was a part of the process which seemed to take place which, for all intent and purposes, felt like it occurred in an involuntary way, and which some might say was like being visited. Now, I think one can take or interpret that word in many ways, but for me, the act of coming up with something from apparently nothing seemed to embody a certain quality of a visitation. To describe my own personal experience with more detail, I'll go back to the days I was preparing for my last recording, The Book of Secrets. Um, in 1995, I, I trundled off to a place in Tuscany with my books, and. Uh, I, I've learned that, that in, as I was mentioning earlier, there's a kind of, a, for me, a, a, a kind of delicate dance uh, that I have to undertake with myself. What I would do is I would read a lot of books, make a lot of notes, and then I would pile myself into the car and drive around the countryside, uh, not focusing on the material really much at all. I would have with me my notebook and I would have with me a cassette recorder, and I would just watch the countryside move by. And I found that the constant visual uh, changing of the scenery to keep this kind of um, a creative process uh, loose and, and, and fluid, uh, that it would, would be quite common that I'd be thinking about something entirely off the wall <laughs> or very different, and, and a melody would come, and I would just grab my, 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 my tape recorder and notate it in that capacity, and then I'd forget about it and move on. Um, or, as I, as I was mentioning, that I would use some of my notes as a kind of departure point uh, to embark upon a fusion of imagination also with, with information. With this exercise in mind, I've wondered about the similarities in the mechanics between creativity and memory. For example, in the way that I find it hard to remember someone's name when I force it. Similarly, I find it hard to be creative when I am conscious of the act when it preoccupies me to the point of stress. When I've reflected on the physicality of the process, this invocation of relaxation becomes a major ingredient in the successful outcome of a creative exercise. Now, I'm sure someone who specializes in biochemistry can throw some greater light on this, in, but it appears this is some, it is somewhat a universal experience, this relaxing part of the equation. Then there's the idea, the working of an idea, turning it and turning it like a, a Rubik cube or, or a prism, holding it to the light to see what angle seems to allow it to speak with clarity and distinctiveness, strength and effectiveness. In my experience, I've tried to infuse the process with approaches of nonlinear thinking and thinking outside the box. And this is one of the greatest challenges I, f um, I find even in the writing process. How does one avoid plagiarizing themselves? How do you shake loose the bonds of conformity, which to me seem like the death knell of creativity? I'm constantly looking for ways to shuffle the deck. This is why for me personally, to be in or on a vehicle of travel, with possibly the exception of an airplane, where the scenery is changing enough to stimulate those creative impulses and thwart the gridlock of muscle memory. 
when ideas come, <clears throat> when ideas come, uh, so does the unknown. For some who are working in the sciences or, and or in politics, one could argue that there are also come great responsibilities with ideas. When I think back on one of the books I was researching for the Book of Secrets, a book called Science and the Secrets of Nature, there was a chapter describing the evolutionary process, of, process from alchemy uh, to that which we would now refer to as science. And there was great concern about issues such as the principle of who should have certain information born out of these ideas. And no doubt there is a contemporary relevance to this concern as we live in an age of recipes of human cloning and nuclear weapons. Um, another uh, thing that was just uh, mentioned to me before I, I began uh, this this, uh, this morning, um, and I'd sort of like to, it's a, a completely off the wall type of moment, um, but it ties back into that, that uh, uh, issue of, um, of, of madcap ideas and coming here and not, not singing or singing and so on. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very heavily involved in another subject to do with water safety and, and part of my being sidetracked over this past couple of days has been trying to, uh, we're, we're involved in uh, the, uh, concerning ourselves with the inquest that's occurring up in Tobomori and trying to also reconcile an event that's going to happen this weekend, the Toronto Dragon Boat event on the, the Toronto Islands. And this whole, this whole exercise of trying to bring together, here is an accident that is an incident that has already happened, here is one that is in the wings waiting to happen. And that whole process of how do you, how do you bring uh, your ideas to bear in terms of understanding human nature and psychology. So that was an elect about turn. Um, I'm going to finish off with, uh, I'm just going to finish off with this statement. I believe ideas are opportunities uh, to be sought after at any level, even if they are on how to plant your garden in a better way. I know, and no doubt there are millions of ideas to be sought after that already exist. I guess the question is how excited are we about the possibility of reaching an idea, new or old, and where that idea may take us. At the end of the day, it may come down to how badly you need something or are curious about something. But what I do know for sure is everyone is capable of an idea and therefore capable of a creative process. And once one believes and allows them to become, themselves to become excited about that, our world definitely becomes a richer place. Thank you very much.